So we're all familiar with the concept of the midlife crisis. You picture a kind of pallid, balding guy with an expanding waistline who suddenly figures out that he's unhappy in his current career. So he tries to radically transform himself by quitting his job as a stockbroker or a used car salesman and throwing himself into a brand new pursuit, like ballroom dancing or cross-country biking. In the archetypal story, these attempts are hardly ever successful. And our protagonist eventually has enough of his misadventure returning to his cubicle before the next mortgage payment is due on his suburban home. Although I barely entered my 20s, I share many of these same unhappy feelings. I'm having what you might call a quarter life crisis. In December, I'll graduate from NYU Stern School of Business, famous for producing successful accountants and consultants and bankers. And I've just figured out that I don't want to be any of those things. While I'm interested in computer programming and maybe might go to law school, all I actually want to do is practice yoga and write angsty dystopian novels. And the classic question that you get in every interview, where do you see yourself in five years, is panic inducing. Because it reminds me that I'm not even sure when I'm going to do laundry next week. <laughs> I shared these concerns with a professor who was kind enough to meet with me and discuss my career. Surprisingly, he actually thought that I was ahead of many other people my age, simply because I wasn't trying to pin myself down to a single linear five-year plan. He shared that he'd started his career as an engineer and then moved into research and investment banking through a few strange strokes of luck and then worked in real estate and a few other commercial industries before finally settling down into academia. Adaptability or the embracing of change was the key to his success. After that, I realized that the halls of Stern were filled with MBA students in their 30s and 40s who were going through the exact same midlife crisis as the unhappy suburbanite in my opening story. But many of them weren't returning to their cubicles at all. Instead, they were making wild leaps into brand new jobs in new industries completely unlike the ones they'd previously been in, or even starting their own companies. And I started to realize that the idea that we're bound by our mortgages and our receding hairlines was sadly outdated and incompatible with the way that many people lived their lives today. And I wondered why the idea of the life crisis was still seen as a cause for alarm instead of a welcome opportunity for growth and change. Why do we glorify stability? Why is it that since the age of four, I've been asked the same question over and over? What do you want to be when you grow up? As if there can only be one such answer. Why is it that now, as I'm about to graduate from college, is the answer that I've been giving my whole life, I'm not sure, no longer an acceptable reply? And why is it that a few years from now, I'll probably never hear this question again, as if 40 or 30 or even 25 is already too late to change your mind? If you think about it, our country actually has a lot in common with a volatile, emotional, young 20-something. <laughs> it's obsessed with technology and the internet, with our head of state using Twitter as his primary form of communication. It's rebelling against its parents, the founding fathers who wrote its constitution, and rolling its eyes at all the things in it that are literally so last century. <laughs> it has a crushing $1.3 trillion of student debt. And, like many of us, it's struggling to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up, wavering between two unstable extremes, resulting in one of the most divisive political moments in American history. This uncertainty of our nation's quarter-life crisis is making many people uneasy and wishing that we were back in a time that was stable and felt safer. When I start to worry about my future, I long for the glory days of fruit roll-ups and Disney Channel movies, when my biggest worry was the boy who sat next to me on the bus picking his nose. 
when we start to feel nervous about our nation's future, we elect a leader with the campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, who lures us like moths to flame with false nostalgia for an unidentified moment in the past. The driver of all of this uncertainty is technological change and the trends of automation and globalization that it creates. By the end of this decade, about 16% of all jobs that exist currently in the US will be automated. And this number is expected to increase to 47% by 2035. We already have AI systems that can write screenplays and give financial and medical advice and even build new AI systems of their own. People of all ages and all educational levels are worried that they'll soon lose their jobs, if they haven't already, to a machine that doesn't have to feed a family like they do. And while it's true that technology also creates lots of new jobs, for example, social media managers and pro gamers didn't exist 50 years ago, most of us are unprepared to take advantage of these new opportunities. According to a recent survey of large US corporations, over half of them stated that they had trouble finding qualified US workers to fill new positions, forcing them to go abroad to countries like China or India to find the talent that they need. And technology, with its instantaneous digital communication and overnight intercontinental travel, only makes this process cheaper and easier for American business owners. If we can learn one thing from the past is that attempts to stop technological growth rarely get very far. The classic example is during the Industrial Revolution when a group of textile workers called Luddites smashed machines in an angry and desperate attempt to preserve their jobs just the way they were. Obviously, they were unsuccessful, as I'm assuming most of the clothes that you're wearing were not sewn by hand with a needle in thread. Technology simply moves too fast and is too powerful for us to be able to stop. And even if we could, I'm not sure that we should want to. If we were to stop technology in its tracks, what would be the price of our newfound job security and stability? Never curing cancer? Never bringing education and literacy to the furthest reaches of the globe? Never going to Mars? I don't know about you, but that's not a trade-off that I would be willing to make. So if we're not going to try to stop technology, our only option is to change with it. In order for Americans to really start feeling good about technological growth, we must make adaptability the number one lesson taught in our schools and the primary value embraced by our society. My parents and grandparents lived in a world where you maybe had about four jobs during your entire career. Instability and uncertainty were seen as undesirable and frowned upon, like the hapless, you know, midlifer in the story that I opened with. But millennials like me live in a very different world, with most of us having at least four jobs by the time we turn 32. And our children, they're likely to have at least four jobs at once. This isn't because each generation is increasingly becoming more restless or picky or coddled or any one of the many other words that are constantly ascribed to us. It's simply because technology is moving faster now than it ever has before, meaning that jobs are created and destroyed more quickly. In 1958, the average age of a company in the S&P 500 was 61 years old. Today, that number is 18. Our country's economic landscape is increasingly coming to be dominated by new and disruptive companies. And if we want to take advantage of the opportunities that they offer, we must be ready to radically overthrow and transform our own careers. The answer to this isn't just more programming or STEM computer science classes in schools, although those are certainly important. It goes deeper than that. And it lies in defeating the notion that education is for the young. 65% of grade school students will start their careers in jobs that don't exist yet, meaning that the STEM classes that they take today 
while great for teaching them critical thinking abilities and developing an interest in technology, are unlikely to give them the technical skills that they'll need in their first nine to five. In the same way, many of the skills that I and my classmates are learning in our technical classes will probably be out of date as well by the, by the time we're done paying those student loans that I just talked about. The education of the future will be a combination of traditional educational institutions, massive open online courses, career and technical training programs, and lots of individual study by people of all ages and in all walks of life. And the stereotypes that currently exist in today's white collar America against those who don't hold a four year college degree or against those who obtain it part time or while working will have to be deeply rethought as these lines continue to blur. Adaptability doesn't have to mean giving up everything that you've learned or experienced in the past. My first job was as a waitress in a small family owned restaurant in my hometown. And I did everything. I washed dishes, I cleaned the bathrooms, I dragged the dirty water from mopping the floors to the drain out back at night. Since I've come to college, I've had many business internships and none of them have asked me to do any of those things. But they have asked me to follow directions, to work quickly under pressure, and to be kind, helpful, and courteous to clients. All things that I learned just as well in that tiny restaurant kitchen. As we saw in my professor's story, the best careers often don't take a linear route, a fact that is only going to become more prevalent as adaptability increasingly becomes the most important skill to have for a successful career. I'm having a quarter life crisis, and that's great. I'll have many more of these moments throughout my career, and those will be great also. They'll help me to make friends with surprise and uncertainty and keep me open to opportunities that present themselves in my life. They'll keep me on my toes and prevent me from being lulled into a false sense of security and thinking foolishly that my life can remain the same in a rapidly changing world. They'll keep me nimble and agile, always ready to grow in areas where before I had been weak. And most importantly, they'll help me take my crisis and turn it into a moment of opportunity. So stop asking your child, what do you want to be when you grow up? Instead, ask her, what do you dream about? Ask her, what adventures do you want to have? And ask her, how do you want to change the world? Help her frame her goals and desires in a way that will keep her open to tackling unexpected challenges. Instead of just having her choose from a list of pre-prescribed career paths that may or may not have vanished or mean something completely different by the time she gets there. Instead of saying, I want to be a doctor, let's say, I want to cure disease. Instead of saying, I want to be a lawyer, let's say, I want to fight for people's rights. And instead of saying, I want to be an artist, Let's say, I want to make the world beautiful. <laughs> that way, when someone or something inevitably becomes better than us at our day-to-day -day tasks, instead of feeling resentful and giving up, we'll find a new way to pursue our goals and our dreams. This is how we build a society based not off of anger and fear, but instead off of meaning, purpose, and maybe even happiness. Thank you.